Welcome to the Chris Wilson Institute of Psychiatry and Social Research. And welcome to the first lecture of the 2005-2006 seminar series. Are there people who have not been here before? I see a lot of the old faces welcome back. Well, welcome to the people who who are here for the first time. The Institute is simply a series of lectures that run from September through June, the second Thursday of every month. The lecture is always about racism, white supremacy. Why is that so? The reason that the lecture is always about racism, white supremacy, I'm a general psychiatrist, child psychiatrist for the past 30 plus years. And I have understood that we as black people cannot have mental health if we don't understand racism, white supremacy. We really cannot have effective intelligence if we don't understand racism, white supremacy. So I have given these lectures over a number of years, 15 years, second Thursday of every month, over and over and over again. The, one of the managers at the uh, Blackburn Center said, I wonder if you're going to be back in September, Dr. Welch. And I said, as long as you're here, I want to be I am going to be here. So, welcome to the Institute. I hope that you will be able to come, continue to come in the future. Next month, the second Thursday, I've asked Mr. Neely Fuller if he can come and lecture, so he will come the second Thursday in October, and I'll speak in November and December. And we will continue through June. Now, sometimes events happen so that you don't have to work too hard to help people understand racism. I presented a paper at the National Medical Association in July, the last week in July. I'm a member of the National Medical Association, that's the Black Physicians in America, an organization that started because black physicians many years ago could not become members of the American Medical Association. So black people started their own, people started their own organizations across the board. The paper that I presented was entitled The Denial of Racism white supremacy and its implications for black mental health and black physical health. For the past 35 years, with the exception of two years, I have always presented a paper at the National Medical Association. And my paper is never about the emotional response of chipmunks. <laughs> All of my papers have been about racism, white supremacy. My first paper was the paper that some of you are familiar with who have read the ISIS papers or even seen the Crest Theory. The Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism, White Supremacy was presented at the National Medical Association in 1970 in Atlanta, Georgia. You see, so that's 35 years ago. That was the first paper. All the other papers that you find in the ISIS papers, many of those papers were presented at the National Medical Association. The motherfucker and the original motherfucker. Uh, ball games as symbols in the system of racism, white supremacy. So I'm always talking about racism because my experience has been, when I was graduating from undergraduate school, 1957 at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. My parents said to me, what do you want for graduation? And something made me say, 
send me to Germany. I didn't ask him for a car. Maybe I should have. But I said, send me to Germany. I want to live with German people. And I want to ask them personally, did they know what they were doing to their neighbors? Who were Jews, but semi to the Jewish religion that Hitler said they are not white. Mm -hmm. It wasn't their religion that he moved against, but he said because they are not Aryan, they are not white. And so I wanted to live with German people and ask them, did they understand what they were doing? And I lived with German people. I lived on a farm outside of Frankfurt, Germany. And this is 12 years after the end of the war. The newspaper wrote an article, Brown Francis from Chicago is also here. But the young German people, it was a work camp, and the young German people, of course I was the only black person, and there were young German people who were still going around saying, how Hitler. And I would ask them, don't do that. You know, like if I came up on them and they were doing that, and I would say, don't do that, and they would say, I'm sure they didn't see video, you know, excuse me. And they would stop when I was around. But they would continue to do it, just meaning that even though the war was over, they believed in what Adolf Hitler stood for. And a reason that I have always read a lot about that, and you'll see in the flyer, one of the pages says, New Orleans is America's Auschwitz. Because I may have a hundred books in my library about what happened in Germany. And if you read about what happened in Germany and what led up to what happened in Germany, you will see the same thing. The people that were lined up, waiting for transport. They had the Jews lined up. They wouldn't give them water. They wouldn't give them food. And they didn't have any sanitary amenities. And they stood and they stood and they stood while people with rifles around them to put them on trains to go to a concentration camp. Now, if you listen to the news carefully, even the mayor of New Orleans talked about it that the people that were on that, what was it, 910 or that overpass, they wanted to get off and go and get water and food. But the soldiers prevented them. Armed people prevented them from getting off of that overpass. See now, when I was talking to my colleagues in psychiatry, now these are black psychiatrists from all across the country. I have the reputation of, oh, here she goes again, <laughs> <laughs> talking about racism. But more people come to my section. Francis, when are you speaking? What are you going to talk about from all of the different sections? They try to schedule me at a time. A lot of people can come because the people always want to come and stay and ask questions. But my colleagues are still very timid. Now see, do we understand that? See, that timidity is related to there is opposition to black people talking about racism. You see, there are all kinds of implied, if not overtly stated, threats. I was a professor at the University, Howard University, Medical School, Department of Pediatrics. In 1968 to 1975. And that's where I started writing about racism. I wrote the Crest Theory of Color Confrontation at Friedman's Hospital. 
as assistant professor of the Department of Pediatrics. When I expected promotion and tenure, some of my colleagues, you know the grapevine. So some of my colleagues whispered to me, Francis, you're not going to get promotion and tenure. Now I was a student at the medical school at Howard. Knew all the professors. Knew the dean. And I said, why? <laughs> And so they said, because of your political ideas. So, you know, like a naive young person, I go trotting off to the dean's office and say, you know, I, I'm sure you know that I want promotion in Kenya. <coughs> See, this was a former scheduled meeting. It was even tape recording the meeting. And I said, but I hear on the grapevine that I'm going to be denied promotion and tenure because of my political ideas. And I said, what political ideas? And he sat and said, that paper that you wrote. Since I'd only written the one paper. <laughs> and I said, well, what's wrong with the paper? He said, it doesn't make sense for you to say that white people are envious of black people's skin color. And I said, but white people tell me this. I don't ask black people what white people think. And I have all these letters from white people saying when they read the press theory, they would write and say, you're right, I always wish that I had color. And the Hank article here, turn to the last page. See, time is interesting. Just hang in <laughs> and the truth will out. You see this article about tanning addicts? I just have to have a tan, even if I get skin cancer. So anyway, to make a long story short, I was denied promotion and tenure. After that, I became clinical director of what used to be Hillcrest Children's Center. Because after I didn't have a job at Howard, these people hired me, paid me twice as much to work half as long. <laughs> and that was fine. I did a good job at the end of the year. They said, well, we would like you to work full time. And I said, well, okay. Then I got a letter or call from the director of the center. Wait a minute. <laughs> Talk. We cannot hire you full time until you bring the board a copy of the press here. See, but I had also had an earlier experience in working at the North Community Mental Health Center, which is right up on Spring Road. And when I decided, well, let me work with the children's program. All the children are black. Let me work with that. But there were no black people in charge of the program. All the psychiatrists in charge were white. And so when I said, okay, I'd like to work in the children's program, and the head of the children's program scheduled a meeting for us to talk about me being hired up on Spring Road. All the children were black, the black community, all the families were black. And he said to me, you have an excellent reputation as a psychiatrist. However, all of our other psychiatrists are white. And you make white people uncomfortable. <laughs> so I just kind of laughed. <laughs> I chuckled and I said, wait a minute, you're telling me that I have an excellent reputation as a psychiatrist, which is supposed to be our job. <laughs> and here we are in a black community, all the patients are black, all the families are black, 
but I can't be hired because I keep people uncomfortable. I said, isn't that funny? <laughs> Fortunately, the head of mental health at that time, that's a long time ago, was one of the black psychiatrists who forced him to hire me. But you understand, you get the picture. See, it's not easy, so I understand black people's nervousness about talking about racism. You see, but I'm a third generation physician. My father was a physician, his father was a physician. Back before 1909, when my grandfather died, I never knew him. But he was political. His wife, my grandmother, my father's mother, lived with us, grew up. I grew up with my grandmother. And my grandmother would always say, your grandfather was a race man. Your grandfather was a race man. He spent more time outside of his office politicizing the people than he spent in his office. But my grandmother kept saying, your grandfather was a race man. And that term for maybe younger people don't know what it means. How many people know what a race man means? A race man, that was terminology that was used perhaps in the late 19th century and early 20th century to indicate that somebody who was committed to, not committed to being accepted by white people, but being committed to the development of black people. I remember the head of the Department of Pediatrics, because, you know, I guess I was always kind of radical. And the chairman of the department said to me one day, he said, Francis, you know, I think you really love black people. <laughs> and I said, that's the best compliment you could give me. You see, because I remember one of my colleagues saying, because I, you know, radical young person in the department, I said, you know what? We could be the point of expertise in the health care of black children in the United States. If anybody wanted to know about the health of black children, they would come to Howard University, Department of Pediatrics, and we would be the experts. And then we would become experts in people's health care in the Caribbean, and then experts in black people's health care in Africa. And one of my colleagues, who was married to somebody of the other persuasion, <laughs> said, Francis, no, that would be second <laughs> To become experts in self. You see, but I'm glad I was raised the way that I was. You see, when my parents all came and I'm not bragging, I'm just talking about, well, how did I get from there to here? I didn't have a choice. It was the way they, I was raised. You see, be political, help black people, focus on the problems of black people. Your job going to medical school is to come out and help black people, not to go to Harvard, or Yale, or Princeton, where there might be three black people. So that was my orientation. So I started writing about racism, you know, like what's making white people do the things they do. And in the 19th, I started writing the Crest Series, 1968, 1969. I was interested in what was making black people mentally ill. See, I trained at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. And then I trained your child psychiatry at Children's Hospital. Looking for what is making black people mentally ill, because I want to know, because I'm going to be a doctor to black people. But that was not a part of the curriculum. <laughs> There was no focus on the mental health of black people in the entire training in psychiatry 
in the entire training in child psychiatry. As a matter of fact, at Children's Hospital, 1963 to 1966, they told us, a few black people in the training program, I mean residents in training to become psychiatrists, black people do not have the mental capacity to benefit from psychotherapy. The best treatment for black people is medication. Now this is 30 plus years later, education. Now this is 30 plus years later, and that is where mental health is for black people. There's no discussion of what is causing the problem. <coughs> Just give them this medication, and there's more emphasis that way now than it was 30 years ago. You see, but I still was looking for, wait a minute, what this racism is making. All I took histories on. Racism would be someplace in the history, just like racism is in the history of every single person in this room. Affecting parents, affecting grandparents, affecting great-grandparents. Racism was being put on those slave ships. So I was, what is this racism? I interviewed a patient at D.C. General Hospital one night. And because, you know, if you're on call, you got to be up all night admitting whoever the police bring in or whoever families bring in that are acutely disturbed. And there was a tall black man. And I interviewed him. The first thing I wrote down was schizophrenic reaction paranoid type. But there were not a lot of people there, so I said, I'm going to talk to this man and see if I can really understand what is he saying in this round about confused way. And the gentleman finally said, Doc, if we can just find the keys to the puzzles. Now, if you look at the ISIS papers, you see the keys to the puzzles. He said, if we can just find the keys the colors. Now that clicked in my brain because I'm looking for the answers about racism. So 1960, what? 1968, while I was doing a fellowship in child psychiatry, I'd be sitting in my office, quiet, at night writing up cases. And I would get this message, go to the Black Power Committee. Now, it wasn't in here. It was in here. Those are different messages. <laughs> so if you get a message here, you're here. That means one thing. But this was, go to the Black Power Committee meeting. If you said, well, was it a male or female voice, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But it's just over and over again. I didn't go to meetings. I finally went to the Black Power meeting down on U Street. That was in the days when Stokely Carmichael, Chuck Stone, all the radicals up from the south. And at a meeting or, you know, gathering after one of the meetings, People were sitting in an apartment on New Hampshire Avenue and there was a man over in the corner. I've never met him. He said, racism is a system. You know, when you're looking for something, see, if you don't tell yourself, a question arises in your brain computer. If you don't say, that's a stupid question. And then go and turn some music up loud. But if you, a question arises in your brain that you want an answer to, you will move around and eventually you find yourself encountering the answer. So I'm a psychiatrist in training. Training program doesn't teach anything about racism. You have to battle racism in the program. 
when I was trained in child psychiatry, one of my black colleagues said, Francis, how do you get the nerve to argue with these people? I mean, they would be saying some off-the-wall stuff. Like the head of the program once said, this was Mr. Child Psychiatry in the United States. Said black people don't like their color. This is in a training seminar. Black people don't like their color because they're the color of bowel movement. Freudian psychoanalytic theory. And I said, what in the world are you talking about? Because I grew up with my mother reciting Paul Lars Dunbar's Little Brown Baby with Sparkling Eyes. Not you the color, but I'll move that. <laughs> but anyway, that, see, that's the history of the time. But go to the Black Car Committee meeting after the meeting. Here's a person that you've never met saying racism is a system. And my brain, it was almost like statement connect, there's your answer. And so I started talking to Mr. Neely Fuller, who's going to lecture next month. And I used to live right up on Fairmont, 743 Fairmont, right across George Avenue. And we would meet in my apartment, Mr. Fuller, myself, another colleague who was training in orthopedic surgery. And Mr. Fuller would talk about his ideas. And we would be kind of yelling and screaming at each other because the other colleague, he was a Marxist. I had been a Marxist and put it down because it didn't answer the, people, the question. I remember going home one day from college. And you know the family is eating dinner. And I said, I'm a Marxist. And my grandmother said, the more education they get, the dumber they get. <laughs> I knew what she was talking about. I'm 16. Anyway, grandmother was right. But <laughs> so we would talk about these ideas back and forth and back and forth. And being a psychiatrist, you are always wondering why is behavior what it is? So Mr. Fuller talked about racism in the system, and I contend that that is as important a summation as Einstein's E equals MC squared. Because nobody else was looking at racism as a total system. See, people were looking at racism as discrimination. Can't go to this toilet, can't drink from this fountain. And the whole thrust being to eventually integrate ourselves with white people. Take the signs down and we'll all just get along. But Mr. Fuller came along and said, and everybody remember this, remember this, and teach your children. Racism is a system. And he said, what, the system functions in all areas of activity, economic, education, entertainment, labor, forgive the writing, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. So I said, this is, this is fantastic. My brain went to, well, why? Why would they do it? See, why do they behave the way that they do? See, not this. See, Mr. Bush. He said, now these people might get a little bit excited. So I have to call in their minister. Let the people emote about it. I think I understood that Condoleezza Rice went to her community in Alabama and told the people Jesus was going to take care of property. See, 
See, now that puts you in one frame of mind. See, that was what helped hold us during slavery. Don't misunderstand because I'm baptized Baptist. Under the water. In Christian Methodist. A.M.E. Sprinkle. So both sides of the family. So I'm not knocking, demeaning anybody's religion. But there was a white woman at the Race Relations Institute in Nashville, Tennessee until they stopped Raymond Wimbush, who's not more than safe, from having the Race Relations Institute. But the white woman, because the young black person said, I don't want to talk about racism because I'm a Christian. So an older white woman spoke to him and said, look, I'm white, I'm from the South. We taught you all three things. From the side. We taught you all three things. We taught you what to focus on in the book. Slave, obey your master. Turn the other cheek. And you will get your reward in heaven. So you don't have to deal with why. The slave is not to reason why. The slave is but to do or die and get the reward in heaven. Now other people are focusing on getting what they want on earth. You see, but if you can get people to focus on heaven, and I'm not knocking it because there was a period where it was so crushingly hard for us. There was nothing for us to focus on other than there must be a reward somewhere. But the white people were strategic in saying what we will do is give you an image of the Son of God as looking like us. So you'll always be waiting for us. <coughs> to come and say to you. You won't think in terms. Let me analyze the problem. And let me organize my thinking and my behavior in such a way so that I can solve the problem. We can think about Richard Williams, the father of Venus and Serena. He looked at tennis one day and said, oh, people are making money playing this. I'm going to make me two children. They weren't even there when he concluded that. I'm going to make them. Bring them into being. And teach them how to play this game, and they're going to be one or two in the world. People are crazy. You see, but he was analyzing. Oh, this is a game. Okay, it's played knocking the ball back and forth. Okay, and then you can make millions of dollars learning how to play this expertly. Now, I know I'm going to have to train my children at home because if I put them out in the fire of racism prematurely, they will be beaten down. So I keep them at home until they're strong. And then I'll put them out there. Do you all understand? Of analyzing the situation. Now, I understand they may be, what, Jehovah Witnesses or Seventh-day Adventists? They've got a religion. But he was talking about analyzing the game. What's going on? What do you have to do to be victorious? And then learning how to do it. But you've got to answer the question, what is going on? So Mr. Fuller said what's going on is a system of racism. The system is white supremacy, and racism is white supremacy. So don't anybody leave here saying racism and white supremacy. 
racism is white supremacy, and white supremacy is the only racism. There's no black supremacy on this planet. As rapidly as the economy is growing in China, there's no Chinese supremacy on the planet. If people see them getting out of line because they have analyzed the global situation, they say, well, we'll make a SARS virus. Or avian flu. If we need to, we can knock them out of position. So racism is white supremacy. I can stand if I was of the mind and call people who classify themselves as white things and call white people names. Does that affect white people? <laughs> I don't have any power to determine whether they have a job, whether they have an income, what's in their bank account. Racism is power. It's the power equation of what? Over non-white. Please put that in your mind because I entitled this talk, New Orleans Wake Up Call. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. See, if this is a wake up call, nothing else is. As they say, we have crossed the Rubicon. and saw those black people, men, women, old people. That's right. Yes. right. Sitting and dying outside on the street. Mothers with little children without water. Not to mention food and letting them stand and stand and wait and no bathrooms. If you didn't see yourself, you need to go home and do some mirror stuff. See, that's us. That's me. Now, one thing about New Orleans, it has a lot of basic black people. That's right. So some people might look and say, well, that ain't me. Think about it. People we look at and say they're Jewish. Hitler looked at them and said, you're not white because of where you came from. Semite means mixed race. Half black and half white. So they let the people starve. You know, I called people in the black caucus. I said, if you all don't get up <laughs> and have a press conference, if you all don't get up and speak for the people, who will? Who will? Why think about having a black caucus meeting where people are dancing and drinking and socializing? Mm. If you can't get up and speak for the people. I called Senator Fisk off. I said, I'm a physician and I'm talking to the secretary and he's a physician. You know people need water if they're going to survive. Where is the water? You see, but don't ever let those images get out of your mind. Because on the second page of that third page, of the handout,
This is an interview from National Public Radio. Just look at the bottom paragraph. You can read the other part of it tonight. This is a study that was done all levels of government officials in March. In March of this year. And they determined 112,000 households the people wouldn't be able to get out of a flood if a disaster came in war. So they knew. That's right. Mm -hmm. They knew what would happen. See, now this is what you gotta chew and digest. See, they were so busy talking about looters, rapists, murderers, and refugees, <laughs> criminals, when you've never seen that number of people standing quietly, patiently waiting. I called CNN and Fox. <laughs> they might have had to take me to say <laughs> You know, how dare you call these people criminals? Criminals. See, but we had people, oh, they're looting. That's right. But the white people were finding food. <laughs> See, but the reason that our brain computers go in that direction is because we have been trained to hate black. Hate ourselves, hate one another, and it's hundreds of years deep. See, it's hundreds of years deep. And when the black people in the 1960s started talking about Black pride, you know, people are giving their lives to get voting rights. Giving their lives and out of that came black power, black pride, black self-respect. And the powers that be said, and they actually went around. I was here in Washington, Black Power Day, and they would come up with a mic. What do you all mean when you say black power? We really didn't know. You see, but yes, words, black power, black pride, black self-respect. But they understood. And they said, we've got to keep this in the head. We've got to make them movie stars. And we will make them call each other niggers and be glad to be pimps and prostitutes and drug dealers. And that will not any concept of black pride, black power, and black self-respect in the head. And so then it moves up another generation. Oh, what we'll do with these young people, and older people too, we'll have them call Niggers and bitches and whores and dogs and thugs and gangsters. Now, when you see those people standing without food and water and shelter, they have trained us to say it's all right to call us niggers. We're niggers. We're thugs. We're gangsters. We're life unworthy of life. That's a phrase that came out of Nazi Germany. Life unworthy of life. Because Hitler and his propaganda apparatus knew if we put degraded images of Semites and the Jewish religion in the paper every day, then what we have planned for these people the German mind will be prepared to allow it to happen. Mm -hmm. 
niggers. See, that's what niggers are supposed to be, the people who are standing on the road dying without anybody caring about their lives. Little babies separated from their children. I called the White House today. It's a decision, was it? That's right. Mm -hmm. To separate the children from the parents. Right. Right. And not know who they were. See, that's, that's slavery all over the world. Right. See, but anybody who danced to nigger, bitch whore, dog, bow wow, you got to stand up and say, I take responsibility for my part. See, white supremacy said, I'll pay you millions of dollars to stand up. Grab your genitals. Sucking it to each other on BET. Then I can end up calling you rapists. Murderers. In the presence of me killing you. But I'll have the whole world looking at you as a criminal element. And I paid you a lot of money to help me do this to you. But you didn't understand racism as a system, so I could do it to you and make your bling bling so important you can't even see what's happening. Mm, that's real. So we have to give the system a plus. A plus. what racism is. I was reaching back in my basement to get uh, the fertility levels. Did anybody see? Thirteen. Thirteen. This was in the handout in, in 1904, 1903, 203 rather, I'm sorry, 1906. Fertility rates around the world. Non-white people are more productive, producing humans. So look at Rwanda at the top of the list. And have they turned aside in Rwanda? And Mr. Clinton apologized, oh, I should have done more to stop it. Hey, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Malawi, Ivory Coast, Uganda, Angola. All of these people producing many, many people. Turn, look at, look at where the United States is. Rwanda is producing 8.5, the United States is producing 2.1. Next page, wanting more babies. What kind of babies? So when I raise the question, racism is a system for maintaining the power equation of white over non-white, and I said to myself, well, why would they do this on planet Earth? And I just thought about the things I learned in school. See, everybody ought to love school, go to school, learn to read, love reading. Read everything you can get your hands on. Have so many books in your house, there's no place to sit down. <laughs> so I said to myself, why? And I just started thinking about things I've learned. 
And whereas the white population refers to itself as what? Majority. The white population on planet Earth is fewer than one tenth. That means that the black, brown, red, and yellow people are nine tenths. What happens when the one tenth meets with the nine tenths? And they have sex. Strong Thurman? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, I just some our chief scout student Anthony Jones sent me an article about a run along the bay in Maryland that they had some Nazi literature put out in the community. Used to be an all black community in segregated the segregated days. Now the white people is on the water, so the white people started moving in. And so somebody started passing out some Nazi type literature. So the community meeting with the city officials or whatever, the state officials, and one white woman spoke up and said, I'm dating an African American and I guess that's why they burned the cross or did something to her. Now why does that behavior occur? It occurs because when you mix white with non-white, you get colored. <laughs> Some shade of colored. You see, like I've been trying to figure out now, who is yes. Lieutenant General Honoré? <laughs> See, when I saw him yell at that white to put that gun down, you are not in Iraq. And the soldier's face turned red. I said, Honoré must be club. <laughs> you see, but if the white people came out of Europe, in the 15th century, where all around the planet realized that everybody was colored. The white men started having sex with the non-white women. The babies never turned out white. So they started thinking, uh-oh. Uh-oh, what if these men started going from south to north? and having sex with these women, which is why the Nazi literature came out, that white would disappear. White would disappear. Now, if the people who classify themselves on the planet don't want to disappear. See, I ask white people. See, black people should stop smiling. With white people. Not being rude or discourteous, but ask a few questions. See, instead of assuming because Mr. Bush hugged to <laughs> kiss the black baby, or Mr. Clinton put on some dark glasses and played a sack. <laughs> And some black people who want to come to my office said he's the first black president. They need help. <laughs> See, it doesn't take much for people to program to hate themselves. See, like if you've been taught to hate yourself, Hate yourself, call yourself nigger and dog and bitch and whore and gangster and thug. You need somebody that doesn't look like you to validate your image. Now they know that, so they run that game. Jesus was a black man. 
But if he was hanging up in the church, nobody would come. This is not my church. They told us that Mary couldn't get a room in the inn. It's not 
not just by accident. See, they sit down with their little tiny minority selves <laughs> and think. See, even tennis. Somebody asked Arthur Ashe and Jimmy Thomas what they thought about the game of tennis. Arthur Ashe said it's a fun game. Jimmy Connor said it's a matter of life and death. <laughs> life and death. See, it's not just sports, it's life and death. Being winners, being on top, being superior. Who does this Althea Gibson think she is? Who does Serena and Venus, who do they think they are? Not a whole. You see what they say? Now, your thing is to play loud music, play shake booty, and dance. Now, we're going to be over here quietly in some acoustic line room <laughs> and think. And they concluded it was just simple, basic physiology. Men can impose sexual intercourse. We have imposed sexual intercourse on all of these non-white women. Women can't rape men. If I went and found the man of my choice in the room, pulled out my M16 and said, you are going to have sex. <laughs> and I frightened him, what would happen? <laughs> Basic physiology is what it was. I don't care if he took 10 Viagra pills. <laughs> See, the creator probably said, look, I don't want you to ever be in a position when you're in danger, you start taking pleasure and can't run, so I'll fix this up. He said, look, I don't want you to ever be in a position when you're in danger, you start taking pleasure and can't run, so I'll fix it so it won't be any pleasure. And you can flee. You see, so because their issue became quite genetic survival. See, and I, I've asked white audiences, do you want your children to be covered? Do you want your grandchildren to be covered? Do you want your great-grandchildren to be covered? Do you want your great, 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 great? What do they say? They say no. That's why Rodney King, can't we all just get along? Won't work. Why Dr. Martin Luther King envisioning I have a dream that one day Little black boys, and little black girls, and little white boys, and little white girls would all play together. And white supremacy said he's a man of peace, but he's got to go. Because that dream will become our nightmare. That dream will be white genetic annihilation. Are you all with me? So they said, no, we've got to put the pressure on the black male. The more color he can produce, the greater the threat. That's where it comes to if you're black, get back, brown, stick around, yellow, yellow, white, white. The less color, the less threat of genetic annihilation. But even if you pass white and they know that you are really colored material in your genetic history, which is why Adolf Hitler said, I'm looking at you, I can't quite tell. Because <laughs> you all have been miscegenated for 1,000 years. So I want to know who is your grandmother? Who is your great grandmother? Because if I am interested in white purity, I can't have some little genes sneaking in. You can't see them on the surface, but they're hidden and they might show. Do you all understand? 
Now see, this is in spite of everything that we want and have been taught for generations. See, I remember the song we sang in Sunday school. See, my grandfather was head of the deacon and trustee board, so you know we was there every Sunday. <laughs> Couldn't get your ears pierced. Couldn't wear red. <laughs> Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world. Red, yellow, black, and white. All are precious in his sight. Now see, just follow those words. Red, yellow, black, and white. All are precious in the white man's sight. What about Jesus? What's on the Sunday school card? What's in the pictures? And if Jesus is white, his father has to be white. Now that's in our computers. You see, that's why black people will have a musical, Arms Too Short to Box with God. Meaning you can't fight white supremacy. <laughs> See, now, this is upsetting to us, but racism was designed consciously, subconsciously, as a survival system for the tiny population that classifies itself as white. See, I say my definition that is on whatever page that is, is the most succinct, and comprehensive definition of racism that is out in the world today and has not been refuted. The way people who classify themselves as white get away from it is to say we won't talk about racism. We'll talk about classism. It's not really race, it's class. Well, what is class? Neil Fuller, in his book, Textbook for Victims of Racism, said there are four classes of people under white supremacy. Class means power. White upper class, white middle class, white lower class, and non-white non-class. <laughs> Bill Cosby is a multimillionaire. His son was driving a Mercedes. Was killed by somebody who believed in white supremacy because he was with a white woman. Somebody else came to mind. Oprah, a billionaire. Went to Paris and wanted to do some shopping. <laughs> they wouldn't let her in the store. <coughs> she had already been treated like that on Madison Avenue in New York. Now some of the rap artists with all their bling bling money said well, the way they get around it is to call and make a special appointment to come in after hours when they won't be an embarrassment. <laughs> now that's my statement, so they won't be an embarrassment. Me, they got to make a special black appointment. <laughs> in a store that other people walk in at their leisure. You see, so money, as though the amount of money you have makes class, class makes power. How many black people driving around in a Bentley or Mercedes get stopped? 
and ask where you get this car, boy. That's what they say. <laughs> get out of the car. Put your hands on top of the car. Now, boy, don't get sassy with me. <laughs> Because I'll blow you away and you know I will get away with it. Now, what is, do you understand what I'm saying? So, class, forget that. Forget, see, these are ways, let me, I don't want to focus on racism. Let's talk about class. Or, oh, better still, let's talk about how black people discriminate against each other. <laughs> We learned that on the plantation. You see, but all we have to do is raise hands. Massa, make her leave me alone. Massa, stop him from bothering me. He hit me. <laughs> now, you boys and girls in this apartment, I don't want to have to come back here again. <laughs> See, that's the $1.8 million home. 911. See, meaning, class means power. Power. White upper class, white middle class, white lower class. Those may be some poor people in Mississippi. How many of you saw those pictures with all those supplies stacked up in Mississippi? See, I don't think that the white people in Mississippi are going to get a debit card or food stamps as opposed to M O N E Y. Mm. Uh -huh. So, if this is racism, it's not going to go away because we pray. It's not going to go away because we pray. See, the Creator must be sitting somewhere. He, she, force, whatever. Saying, I made you our first people. I made you the mothers and fathers of everybody on this planet. What page is that? Picture with the albino music. Fifteen. See, you may not be able to see this well. But this is a group of people in Africa. Black people. And standing in the middle because some white photographer said, I want to take this picture. Is this little albino mutant white? This is where the white race came from. All the paleontologists and anthropologists are saying human life began in Africa. The first people were black. All black people and anything of color can have a genetic mutation to albinism. They have albino alligators. The white bunny rabbit you see is an albino bunny rabbit. White mice, white rats. Somebody told me it used to be an insult to say, you got so many roaches, you even have some white ones. <laughs> you see, it's roach population. See, in other words, you only get a mutation in after a certain number. You see, it's not every other person is a mutation. The mutations come, you know, very, very low frequency. And so if you have a huge population of roaches, you're likely to have some that are white. <laughs> now, what did the African people do? 
with their mutations to albinism. The same thing that people do here is a genetic malformation. They put them out. Now I'm not saying, I said to an audience of white people, maybe as black people we have to take responsibility for being the first abusive parents because when we produce you as mutations and put you out of Africa, and then you say your history began with Romulus and Remus nursing on a wolf. That means in foster care. <laughs> Rome began with Romulus and Remus. And if you watch the History Channel, you can see the Romans are always fighting and killing and sexual perversion. They had a uh, segment on blood and sex. Because they didn't have any home training. <laughs> Raised by a wolf. Essentially meaning, you know, basically raised by themselves. Didn't have home training. Which is why white people want to talk to black people, Mammy and Pappy and Uncle Ben. See, they still want to be fed. Aunt Jemima, pancakes. Uncle Ben Rice. <laughs> See, this is deep symbolic meaning. I say Oprah show. She's a brilliant woman, but no offense. She's saying to the white people, honey, baby, tell me what's the trouble. <laughs> See, let me fix it. Shirley McLean, Oprah was saying at one point she wanted to lose weight. She was interviewing Shirley McLean. Shirley McLean said, if you use weight, you're going to lose your show. You see, I don't even think she understood what she was saying. It just jumped out. You see, Mammy can't be skinny, Mammy. <laughs> See, all of their stuff fits. And if we ever reach a point where we want to take responsibility for ourselves, as opposed to somebody is going to come along and solve our problem, see, if we decide we're going to solve this problem, that means we have to understand what we are dealing with. Nobody solves the race problem without a definition of racism. When Bill Clinton was president and he set up this big committee, racism, he said racism and solving racism was going to be his legacy. Then he got in the Monica thing. You see, but he set up a race committee. Brilliant historian John Hope Franklin was chairman. At a meeting at the Race Relations Institute, I asked Dr. Franklin, did the committee come up with a definition of what they were going to solve? He said, no, they didn't. You see, so it's like it's possible to play games with people. If you want to know what Mr. Bush thinks about racism, did he cancel the racism conference in Africa? Cancel America's participation. We're not going to deal with that. Mr. Clinton left off as well. That was going to be my legacy, but I didn't get to it. See, so now what? Can we? Understand why solving the problem of racism when racism is the system for their genetic survival. 
So they're not going to dismantle it. Right. We have to be the ones to say, well, this is our understanding of what we're dealing with. This is what we think. This is what we understand the problem to be. I mean, I think it's obscene. If 50 years from now we're still going to meetings, there might not be any of us left. You see, because they said, wait a minute, the black male can cause white genetic annihilation. White females say their ideal mate is tall, what? Dark and handsome. A white woman stood up in one of our meetings, said she's married to a white man, but she wants to have sex with a black man. <laughs> a white male said to me, Dr. Wilson, do you know what white men say? And I said, no, I don't. He said, white men say they're not men until they have had sex with a black woman. So they have demonstrated what they think. They just look around, look at our multicolored white male penis work. I meant to say breast work. See, we have to get real, ladies and gentlemen. We have to stop. Oh no, it's not racism, it's a race car. It's the whole deck. It's the whole system. Is there any area of activity that anybody has experienced, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, where black people don't experience racism 24-7? Is it entertainment? Turn on the television. See, when you see all those white women with their blonde hair, straight, you're learning racism. The children are learning racism. The children are learning this is supposed to be beautiful. The Aryan idea. Even though it's bleached. How many people have seen black people discussing New Orleans? Five New Orleans. Five black people in a room talking about what's happening to black people in New Orleans. Three black people sitting and talking. One black person talking without being contradicted. You see, so if you just turn on the television, unless you don't, unless you have your screen of understanding racism, your computer is being filled with white supremacy things. Everything that we look at, a part of white supremacy things. And if we're going to understand our situation, it's not a question of hating white people. That's a waste of time. Amen. Being discourteous to white people, waste of time. If you're going to sit down and play a chess game, you're on the black side of the chess board, are you going to win by hating your opponent and making faces at your opponent and sticking your tongue out? No. You tell your opponent, make your best move. Make your best move because I understand this game. I know how to play it. So when Mr. Fuller does a whole book on these are the moves that they're making on their side of the board, so to speak. These are the moves that black people need to make. The first move is to understand racism and white supremacy. I have Mr. Fuller's statement. If you don't understand white supremacy racism, what it is, 
faith finds what it is and how it works. Everything else that you think you understand will only confuse you. <laughs> you see, it's just like watching football. If you don't understand the game, you don't understand all those different little running moves that the people are making on the field. But somebody who understands the game knows exactly why every move is being made. Because of what the game is all about. That could be true of basketball, any sport, tennis, soccer. Understanding what the game is all about. And our brain computer has to fight with it. No, I want to believe they love me. See, and this is where something very critical comes in. We have to learn how to love ourselves. Each individual person loving themselves, not asking, baby, do you love me? Forget that. See, love yourself and interface with people who can respect your respect for yourself. You see, but not starting with, well, wait a minute, I know we've had generations, generations, generations influencing patterns of parenting, influencing parenting absence because of racism, white supremacy. So we have to consciously undo that by learning to respect and love ourselves. Take off your clothes when you get home, stand in front of a full-length mirror, and say, I like myself just like I am. All right. Not if. No qualifications. I love myself just like I am. I respect myself just like I am. I don't have to have a quarrel. Some reporter called me last week. Dr. Rushing, I want you to uh, give me a call back because I'm doing this article on how black women relate to each other. What's the Morton determinant of how black women relate to each other? That's a question, Clay. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> Racism, white supremacy, and whether or not the person has been taught to hate themselves or like themselves, that's one part of it. Page 16. Let's read the first two sentences. There are nearly two million black women, there are two million more black adult women than men in America. Start testimony to how often black men die before their time. Do you all understand? Can you put that together? Why are there so many missing black men? Question, players. The class is going to have to take the class over that tonight. <laughs> The missing black men have to do with this. If the fundamental concern of the system is white genetic survival, the persons who threaten white genetic survival, either in 
the production of more black children. Or they might be enticed by white females. So they have to be killed. They have to be destroyed. I mean, class, don't you get it? If, I mean, everybody, we gotta get rid of them. This is white supremacy thing. So how can I get rid of them systematically? First of all, I've got to understand what my objective is. See, these things are not happening by accident. Oh, I wonder why there's so many black men in prison. The woman said, you don't understand white supremacy racism. <laughs> See, everybody ought to memorize that little sentence. What it is and how it works. Everything else that you think you understand will only confuse you. See, we'll forever be scratching our head. I don't know why that's happening. See, it's even prolonging life. When you see a phenomenon and you are able to say, and your brain computer is able to say, oh, I understand that. As opposed to, why is that happening? Why is this happening? Hey, what's happening? Do you know what's happening? Anybody know what's happening? See, the way we greet each other. Hey, what's happening? What, what's going on? Do you have a clue? Anybody have a clue? See, as opposed to, somebody said, Louis Armstrong said, somebody said, say, Pops, what's happening? And he said, the white man is still in charge. <laughs> See, that's like New Orleans. See, the black people can play those horns, play the piano, make the white folks happy. But a physician friend of mine, native of New Orleans, she said, New Orleans is like the Upper East Side of New York, and this is the way. That's right. <laughs> she said, sometimes you'll turn a corner in our community and you'll think you're back in the early 1900s. That's right. <laughs> now that's white supremacy. That's black people in their place. So the people can go and listen to the trumpets play and then see effectively people enslaved. And everything is a big easy. That's right. <laughs> White supremacy, the big easy. Just stay in your place. That's right. Don't cause no problems. Do you know what I'm saying? So. The attack on black males. Racism is a war against non-white people in general and black men in particular. Now if we begin to understand that, the dice of racism, and we begin to ask ourselves, well now what are we going to do about this war? What are we going to do about this situation? Sometimes our answer is being, where's the party? <laughs> See, that probably is why black caucus we can turn more and more into a party fest. Do you, do you see fashion show? Because when you start talking about black people's problems, What's the first thing you run into? The system. If you talk about housing, if you talk about unemployment, if you talk about can't get loans and how banks are treating black people, if you talk about poor education, the cost of college education, 
failing elementary schools? What can, what can we black male female relations? They'll have a symposium on black male female relations. <laughs> Somebody might start talking about perfume and positions. <laughs> Been there, tried that. <laughs> Doesn't work. You can't have male-female relations and men not out of their role. You can't have male-female relations with unemployed men. Bush says he's going he's to be promoting marriage amongst the black people. <laughs> marriage is a business. You have to have income. If you don't have income, you're going to start fighting. Yep. Are you all with me? So if white supremacy says, I'm going to do my level best to knock the black men out of position, I can determine what happens in black male-female relations. Because I can make them fight. All I have to do is cause unemployment. Her losing her job, his losing his job, both of them losing their job. And they will blame each other because nobody else can understand this is racism in this house. The big elephant in this house, no matter where we move, oh, we're going to leave the inner city and go to the suburbs. The elephant goes with you. Because the elephant can increase the price of gasoline. <laughs> And then all the furniture has to go back. <laughs> also the car. Do you all understand? But if we understood racism, that this is constant, continuous until it's checkmated. Then it can be checkmated. See, it's like playing checks or checkers. And the opponent says, why don't you move your piece here? I mean, does everybody understand what that is? Your opponent is telling you to move your piece in a particular place. What's your conclusion? They want to take my piece. So you say, no, I've got another move in mind. I have some other moves in mind. See, one-tenth of the people on the planet are in control. As long as they can program a critical mass of the nine-tenths to cooperate with them. Now that means going over to Africa and picking somebody who is certainly uneducated. I mean, they don't know what's happening. They say, now I'm going to make you president. <laughs> I'm going to make you president. And uh, I'm going to be paying you thus and so amount of money. And I'm going to give you military. And you know when you see pictures of Africa and the people standing in those uniforms and boots and guns and beating up on each other? That's why it's supremacy in operation. Like some African gets out of line, Patrice Lumumba. Or we simply have to kill him. Or Nelson Mandela, we'll put him in jail for 27 years. If we don't kill him. Or Martin Luther King, we'll kill him too. And we'll kill Malcolm X and never ever. So they'll get the point. I don't want anybody doing their own thinking. I just want people who can follow the script. See, unfortunately, these people got the Kanye West. He spoke the truth. Now, do you want to continue to make these records? 
I think an apology is going to be in order. You see, but it's not just dependent on Kanye West. It's dependent upon how are we thinking, speaking, and acting, and what do we understand? If we had a critical mass of black people just walking around understanding what the deal is. And like the African proverb says, each one teach one. So if you understand, you're not teaching the next dirty joke. The next new trashy language. See, we would frighten white supremacy to death. Uh-oh. Hey, they're not calling themselves bitches and whores any longer. We got a problem here. What's happening? They'll be saying what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can't get them to call themselves niggers. Chris Rock is going to stop his show. Or the boondocks young man. Who's got a series coming out where they're supposed to be using the word nigger frequently. <laughs> New season. Because if black people say it's okay to use the word nigger, it doesn't mean anything. See, does black people into understanding, not expecting that the white side of the chessboard, they're going to keep doing what they're doing. They say, this is my survival. I'm trying to survive by whatever necessary means. HIV, Ebola, breaking the levy. That's right. That's right. See, if somebody will produce HIV and kill tens of millions, why wouldn't they kill hundreds of thousands? Reality. When people sit down and say, I want a virus that's going to attack the immune system. But see, when that card runs through the computer, Jesus wouldn't do this. <laughs> God wouldn't do this. Do you know it? <laughs> They make viruses. They make ethno-specific viruses read. Read a higher form of killing. Read. See, read. Turn off the television. Yes. That's right. Read. Reading is more important. Repeat. Reading is more important than watching TV. I ran into Dick Gregory in the newsstand up on Silver Street last week. I was buying four newspapers <coughs> last week. I was buying four newspapers. <coughs> he was buying twenty. <laughs> So when Dick Gregory comes up with his ideas, he's way out in front. Because he's red. What are they saying? What are they doing? Oil in New Orleans. That's right. See, but look at New Orleans. Start with, they knew. Exactly what would happen and how many people would be affected. Now what's the proof? 
See, if you have that level of contempt for people, the contempt will be manifested. So it doesn't matter if they stand without food and water. Because you already concluded life unworthy of life. So this is why we're going to do this. We're going to allow this to happen. Now, I thought maybe they had a plan where simple urban, urban, urban renewal. Sort of like D.C. <laughs> we move them out gently <laughs> to the suburbs. And put prices on condos that they couldn't possibly afford to come back in. I thought possibly if you went to the urban planning or the city planning office in New Orleans where they could drop charts down of what the new New Orleans, the better, the bigger, the better New Orleans. When New Orleans comes back in the 1960s after they had the riots, if some of us black power people went to the urban planning, city planning area, they were dropping maps of already designed 14th Street. Trees and apartment buildings and parks. And I said, black people are not going to be able to afford to live here. Oh, people want <laughs> New Street has tanning problems. I was standing at the corner of 13th and you and felt that cold vibe of all the people around me, almost like, well, what are you doing here? That's right. <laughs> Playing for the new morning. So what do you do? You let them languish without food and water. And then you could have moved them to maybe an Air Force base or it's not being used or something. And the people could have been all together. Families could have been together. No, but it's more important to send some to Arizona and some to Vermont and some to D.C. and some to Chicago and some to San Diego. Now, we don't know who went where. And then we start to, oh, the water was so polluted. That's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. That it would be so toxic and the mosquitoes and the E. coli and other viruses causing meningitis. <coughs> but somehow that wasn't going to affect the people in the French Court. Right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Drop it. See, all those strong, they might be poor, but those are strong people. That's right. That's right. All little babies. You look at some of those little babies. That's right. <laughs> you see, but unknown viruses are supposed to be jumping on them. See, now black people ought to be calling the White House hotline. That number is 202-456-1111. Say it again. 202-456-1111. And we should be registering. My priority is that, yeah, put the people in a comfortable, safe place. Find all the parents of all the children. Find all the families that belong together. Sign a contract that they will go back to New Orleans where they came from. That's right. 
They can put up temporary trailer parks and step by step move and make housing, affordable housing for the people to go to. You see, as black people, we should have in our hands all the black caucus people should be saying what the black people want, not the ministers. That's right. That's right. Faith based crime. That's right. Ministers. See, that's fine if they want to build churches as big as, but that's what we're supposed to hide in instead of facing reality. <laughs> where people can put on their new hats and their new clothes and show off in front of each other, go out and get in their Mercedes or whatever. That's what we are supposed to be doing. So we should be saying no because we understand racism and white supremacy and we would really like to be proven wrong. Dr. Wilson even says she would like to be proven wrong. <laughs> that you didn't intentionally do this. But she knows that the HIV virus was intentionally made. So if you make a virus, why wouldn't you break a rabbit? That's right. If the storm didn't break it, then you can just have some of your seals go down there. Blow it up. And put a nice crack in several of the levees. That's right. You see, so that you can say we got to remove these people by force if necessary. You see, but anybody call, you didn't even see Ted Copper when he was going and talking to this elderly black man. Now you know you need to move. Yes. You didn't see him talking to any of the people in the French Quarter. That's right. You see, you saw older black people being kind of buffalo. Now, if you really were thinking well, you would really leave. You know you can get sick. How many floods have those old black people already gone through? Many, many. Many. You see, but if it's a plan, you see, and we should all say to the people who classify themselves as white, well, based on your history, <laughs> based on your relationship with us. See, we are reminded of how we were shipped to different plantations and children never to see their parents again. Husbands not seen their wives and nobody cares. And since you don't talk about racism, we know you haven't had a chance to correct it. So our first thought is that this is what you might do either to get oil or just to build a new New Orleans. The new New Orleans doesn't have black people. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, but what they don't know is whatever music is being played in the French court. It's the soul of all those poor black people That's right. that are making it sound right. That's right. Now when you move it, you're going to move soul. That's right. And New Orleans is just going to be a dry bone. That's right. But we don't allow that to happen because dry bones. That's right. But we don't allow that to happen because black people should be calmly speaking up. No, we want the children with their parents now. Mm -hmm. That's right. We want the old people with their kin now. Mm -hmm. If Castro said he would send 1,500 doctors, if any of our people die and you don't let the doctors come, we're holding you responsible. We have to do this because right. we love ourselves. Right. Right. Those people are us. Right. See that symbol of the top blowing off of the superdome. See the cover being blown off. <laughs> the cover coming off of the reality. 
We are the parent people. That's right. Parents are supposed to be able to face reality. Children need fantasy. Fantasy, the white people are going to come along and start loving us in spite of their fear of genetic annihilation. Fantasy, illusion, maybe delusion. See, I said to the psychiatrist, denial to the point of insanity, if not depravity. You see, where you're denying so that you can maybe get some money. You know, we need to have our agenda about what we want to see happen with the people. Anybody that closes their eyes and says, oh, well, oh, uh, just forget about that. See, if you study the history of Germany, the Jews that were lined up to leave that day, the Nazis would come and knock on this apartment door, this house, and come on out. See, first they would take the men away. That's right. So that the women and the children and the old people would be left. Now the men being taken away are all the black men in prison. That's right. So the community is basically defenseless. The defense that we have is truth to power. That's right. Just that, no, we understand racism. We really are afraid to speak up, but we feel we must in spite of our fear. We don't know what you will try to do to us for speaking up, but we must speak up and defend ourselves because the next group of people may be these people over here. Remember Sam Yet's book, The Chokes, where a survey was done, I believe, by the Department of Navy. If the black people, white people were surveyed, if the black people were removed from your area, would you permit it to happen? What do you think they say? Yes, as long as they're going to be okay. They're going to the astronaut. It's going to be blankets and food there. See, every time I pass our convention center, something goes wrong in my soul. Gigantic buildings, three stories down in the ground, but no parking. Space available. Should our people get out of line? They can go to the convention center. And Walter Reed. <coughs> Raise your hand if you think it can't be done. See, raise your hand if you think it can't be done at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. No, you can't take your records, your CDs. You won't need them. See, I know Jewish people who will tell me they still have a little suitcase packed in the hall closet. See, when I was training at Hillcrest Children's Center, when I was in college, I was a counselor at a Jewish camp in New York. The girl who was my co-counselor, her older sister ended up a social worker at Children's Hospital Department of Psychiatry where I trained. I knew the family. So one day she called me up, Francis, I'd like you to come to dinner. Okay. Go to dinner, I thought it was a group of people. It was just the two of us. Husband gone, children gone, dog gone. <laughs> we had dinner, 
And then she said, well, let's go in the living room and have a glass of wine. Fine. <clears throat> she said, Francis, I want to tell you something. There was a meeting at my home. Now, this is 1967. All Jewish people. We met to discuss, Francis, that the same thing was going to happen to you all that happened to us. Mm -hmm. And what we wanted to vote on was would we be helping you all? She said, Francis, we voted that we would not be helping you all because we had worked too hard to save ourselves. So I said, thank you. You want to tell me that. That's right. The same thing is going to happen to you all mm -hmm. that happened to us. And we voted whether we would be helpful. See, but whether they help or not, whether she'd ever said that or not, everybody in here was probably looking at their TV. You saw the way the people were treated. That was not them, that was us. That's right. See, but we can make that disconnect. See, they made a disconnect in Germany. Hitler said, I'm going to destroy you. And they said, Oh no, that wouldn't happen because we're Germans. Mm -hmm. So they could have followed it up by saying, I didn't leave anything in Africa. Because that's where they came from. How did they get enslaved by the Egyptians according to their story? <laughs> so, Put it in our thinking. See, they thought, oh no, we're Germans, and what do we say? Oh no, we're Americans. <laughs> and that's why you gotta look at that word America and see what that word is an anagram for. I am race. I am race. I am race. I am race. White. So it's not about getting angry, it's about, oh, oh, okay. I think we finally got it. And if we didn't get it, forget it. <laughs> See, if we didn't get it, who we are. The people on the overpass. Mm. The mother said, if you looked at one of those old people and thought, that could be my grandma. Right, that's right. Or mm -hmm. those old men walking slowly. Or those women holding those babies. Or the father holding on to the baby. See, we ought to be saying, thank you, TV. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Because it might have occurred and there were no pictures. Exactly. You see, but we got pictures now. See, if there's anybody confused about racism now, after New Orleans, they really don't deserve oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> See, every black person, and it's not a fun, but can't get angry with white people. See, because basically they're saying up in your face. That's right, in the face. It's like our enslavement was up in our face. Selling us on those auction blocks, up 
up in our face. Now this is up in our face. And again, it's not about like an 18-month-old baby with a dirty diaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, that simply means all the fathers have been taken away. If the fathers had been functional and present, they would have said, boy, pull up your pants. That's right. Hold your hands. Put on some jeans and a shirt. Where's your belt, son? See the pants down, exposing the crack? They're saying, I want daddy symbolically. Penis in anus. Penis in mouth. Do you all understand? See, this is scripted. See, there was some turmoil at Reverend Will Wilson's church. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. See, not to have any big argument going on in the community. What he was laying out was what the article, the disproportion. The two million more women than men. It's just like if you had a prison full of men and no women. The men can relate their sexual urges to one another. And so when the men are in the community and without defiance, conscious defiance of the conditions, the women will relate sexually to each other. Do you all understand? Reverend Wilson should not have been criticized. No, that's, that's right. right. That's right. She was not in reality. See, this is not about homophobia. I'm not talking about homophobia. I'm talking about human dynamics that will take place under conditions of oppression. <coughs> but if people say, well, wait a minute, no. The direction we're going in, is we're saving ourselves as a people. We're not going to be driven into genocide. <coughs> See, but somebody's fear of genetic annihilation will force their opponents into genocide. So we have to decide, no, 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 we're the first people. First. See, and, and discipline, discipline in all of these areas of activity. Sex is fabulous. Yes, it is. So what? See, so what? So what? Do people engage in sex on the battlefield? No. no. Do they jump out of the foxhole and say, I gotta get some? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> To get some when you get home. <laughs> See, serious. We have to transform ourselves into serious people. That the black people are conducting themselves so calmly, I don't know what has overtaken them. Mm -hmm. We can't pay them to buck food and clown. See, they have us buck fooling in all the commercials. Yeah. See, what about the commercial they have, what is that, city? That has a black woman fixing a black man a fruit drink in the garbage disposal. Yes. 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 See, we're so stupid we don't get it. Yes. Don't get it. Yes. We don't get it, we think, well, because they're paying us. Mm -hmm. The Federal Reserve notes. 
the black people, we got to reach the point where the respect level is so high. That's right. There's no amount of money anybody can give us to dismount from our selfishness. See, and when I believe that when that takes place, it's like the million man march. Minister Farrakhan called a million black men just to come and stand in their self-respect. And the most powerful people in the world ran away. They ran away. They thought it was going to be wise. Just standing in self-respect. See, that's what happened in Vietnam. No offense to anybody who served. Under the Vietnamese leadership, they said if every single one of us has to die, you're leaving. That's right. And the opponents dropped their weapons and ran at a critical point. That's the power of self-respect. They had all of the weapons. Understanding racism and white supremacy is a powerful weapon. See, they don't ever say Francis Wilson, come on TV. <laughs> What's your opinion about racism? The very see it's what? True. What's the other person's reality? What makes them tick? See, black men ought to stand up and say, we're afraid of you white people. See how quiet he got. <laughs> see, that's very powerful. <coughs> Your opponent can say, I'm afraid of you. You can genetically annihilate me. I'm genetic recessive. Mm -hmm. You're genetically dominant. Mm -hmm. That's what my big guns are all about. You, try. you can annihilate me with your genes. Mm. And I have to produce weapon can do the same thing. You see, but it's like announcing fear as opposed to, I'm a thug, I'm a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> see? see, that's little baby children playing Superman. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you understand? That does not frighten the opponent. Nope. You see, but to say to the opponent, you got all the guns. So we think we understand what you're afraid of. See, that whole thing about the so-called policemen shooting black men, saying, I thought he had a weapon. Well, he did. <laughs> Doesn't matter. 14 years old, Emmett Till, yes. 14 or 40 or 84. Mm -hmm. See that whole thing. I thought he had a weapon. Their subconscious went here. Yeah. This is where the dominant genetic material is. For white, this recessive. Black is dominant to the inability to produce color. And so they go from that to this. What does that look like? Good. That's the lateral view of this. Turn 90 degrees out. Oh, of this. Turn 90 degrees out. 
Ooh. See, their computer says, you got a weapon can annihilate me. <laughs> Must create weapon can do the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then they call this the great equalizer. <laughs> See, the language, this is their language. See, just like golf, all the sports. <laughs> All the ball games are played. See, every season, there's a ball game to keep them in touch with what's going down. They never have to ask each other, hey, what's happening? Mm -hmm. Because they are maintaining white supremacy to prevent white genetic annihilation, winter, summer, spring, fall. <laughs> Year after year after year after year after year. See what's the most power what game ball games are the most powerful men play? Oh. And what is that game about? And this is the anus. And so the ball can go in the water. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> if the ball is knocked in the water, oh my, it didn't hit the mark, right? Or it can be knocked in the sand trap. <laughs> Or it can go in the rough. Football, basketball, let's do basketball. <laughs> See, because if the game is about genetics and the genes are where class in the ball, you are a flunking anatomy <laughs> in colloquial speech, the testicles. Colloquially, they're referred to as balls. Is that right, John? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and every season has its ball game. <laughs> now we've done it all. Oh, God. I still won't do baseball until that's advanced class. <laughs> You see, the, what, the reason I came up with this is like once you understand racism, the system, what it is about, then your brain computer is like turning another channel 
in your brain computer, it switches over. Oh, you begin to see all the things that are going on at the conscious and or subconscious level. In the system, we're trying to understand decode the system. You know, in the Second World War, that machine that they had that decoded the Nazi code called Enigma. You all better start reading. So you want to decode. Where, where, where is the enemy coming from? Where is the opponent coming from? So one day it was so quiet. This is after I was too racist. On a Sunday it was so quiet. You see, when it's quiet, you can think. When it's noisy, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> the brain computer shuts off from sensory overload. Don't ever forget it. See, when people are going down the street, boom, that boom, coming out of the car, the person is trying to forget about what it is. Trying to forget about what happened to them on the job that day. What happened to them in the relationship that was going haywire. They're trying to forget with the boom, the boom, boom, boom. You see, so make it quiet so your brain computer can begin to hum. So I said, why is it so quiet? And then I said, oh, a ball game is going on. I said, well, this must have something to do with the system. See, there's nothing outside of the system. Everything is in the system. Everything is in the system. So I, and my brain computer just said, oh, wow. They're two series of ball games. What are they, class? Big brown. And small white. Small white. Small white. <laughs> See, does not the culture keep repeating the question, who has the biggest penis, the white man or the black man? <laughs> A friend of mine years ago, her little boy was at some white Bible school. And so she said, he came home and said, Dylan said, I have a big penis. Now these are five year olds. <laughs> Dylan White said to Johnny Black, five years old in the shower, You have a big penis. So the mother said she was shocked. <laughs> you know, a little five-year-old comes home with, what happened to school today? <laughs> <laughs> so the, my friend said she picked herself up off the floor practically and was able to utter. <laughs> and what did you say? <laughs> the little boy said, Black boys have big penises. <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> so the system plays out, see, because black men are genetically dominant. This is how come we have a whole history of what? Lynching and castration. See, black men don't go around castrating white men, cutting off some marbles. No. <laughs> you see, but what is the history? What's the name of the book that the white guy wrote? Without Sanctuary. Without Sanctuary. See, if you haven't read that book, go get that book. And see the pictures, the postcards that white people would make after lynching and castrating black men. Send postcards to their friends and relatives. Print a picture postcards. You see, so the psychiatrist will say, well, what is motivating that behavior? 
See, a black man may stab or shoot, but he doesn't go tampering with genitals. White men tamper with genitals. We just saw it in Abu Ghraib yes. at the prison. Yep. Any men tamper with genitals. We just saw it in Abu Ghraib yes. at the yep. prison. Yep. In Iraq, because those are non-white men, so immediately they go to sexual attack and humiliation. Because these testicles don't do what color testicles do. So my, I said, oh, ball games are on. Two series of ball games in the white supremacy system and culture. Big brown and small white representing genetic recessive and genetic dominance. So big brown, football, basketball. Soccer. <coughs> when you see when you see even the black and white. It's a strike and you see those black patches, you know it's black under the white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Small white. Same bone. <laughs> Tennis. Baseball. Cue ball. Golf. Golf. Thank you. Now, let's just look at the game of billards. Hockey, the black puck. The long black stick, black puck. Born in a white net. Okay. Let's just do billards first. Table. Triangle, symbol of vaginal orifice. And all these balls. Long stick, white ball. Take the wrap off the ball, scatters what? Long stick with white ball, so to knock all the colored balls under the face. Is that the game? White ball is on top of the table at the end. And the game says you don't want to be caught behind the eight ball. Which is black. That means that the power equation of white over non-white would have become reversed to non-white over white, and that equals white genetic annihilation. Are you with me, Clay? Okay, football. The white female says what? Her ideal mate is tall, dark, and handsome. So you have. White upright legs at the end of the field. <laughs> White upright legs. I see a brother getting uncomfortable. <laughs> White girls dancing in short skirts on the side. <laughs> Called cheerleaders. Black girls can hardly get on the spot. <laughs> For cutting the ball through the white upright leg. Does that strike? <laughs> Basketball, same thing, white net. Same symbol. See, now this is what? This is to show somebody who says, oh, she's so focused on Freudian symbol. Freud never got to this. <laughs> That big cigar. <laughs> okay, we can do smoking objects. Same thing. Two series of ball games, two series of smoking objects. Smoking objects are phallic symbols. So then you have what? Big ground. Big ground. 
And small white. Are you with me, Clay? This is our lesson in preventing lung cancer. <laughs> Big brown is cigars, pipes, and more. It might be M O O R. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, okay. Then we should stop. Small white cigarettes. Bang. And what do in the white culture? Go and check your dictionary. Bang. What's the slang word for cigarettes Bang. in the white supremacy system and culture? Fags. See, that's because you all are not reading. Malcolm even said, read the dictionary. See, this doesn't come out of Francis Wilson's brain computer. This is a culture. I simply, once you understand the system, that's like if you're trying to put together a puzzle, you get all the straight edge pieces and set the edge. And then you know exactly where the picture, the pieces in the middle will go. So they flag when a white male has a son, what does he go running to the hospital with? Cigarettes? The men that are supposed to be most powerful smoke what? Cigar. The men that are supposed to be most intelligent? Pipes. Pipes. Still being brown. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, they said more taste better. <laughs> so what are we saying? It's just like all of the, by the time they get through saying, black is ugly. Black is ugly. How many people have seen the male perfume that's called black? They got a male perfume out right now, a black bottle. It's sold at the big department store called Black. That's supposed to entice women, white women to white men. When they put your black on. <laughs> See the same culture telling black people their color is ugly? When is the white woman dressed in her most sophisticated attire? Basic black. Crystal black. When is the white male dressed to the night? Ties and tails. See that long tail hanging down on the back? <laughs> Okay, class, we do have to stop, but what I am saying, we got a master and understanding of racism. What is motivating people? See, all the black people in New Orleans, 60 to 65 percent of the population of New Orleans. That's right. Black people, 30 percent of which were living below the poverty line. That's right. Mm -hmm. So wash them away. What do they understand? So no, we're taking everything to a new level. This is 2005. You've seen New Orleans. Black people are no longer talking about, oh, it's a system of democracy and capitalism. Now you're going to have to learn that to pass the class. But you have to know that's not reality. The system See, we will transform ourselves as a people by deciding we're going to be serious and we're going to understand what's going on and we're going to get our behavior together. Now, when you see those, I'm going to stop there. When you see those images of little children taken away from their parents, little babies, nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, let yourself think foster care system. Because people were playing with sex 
They have not politicized what they do with their sexual organs because they didn't understand racism. So they were making thousands of throwaway children. The children in New Orleans just add to the mix. So politicize your genitals. God bless you all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.